Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this evening for what is sure to be an excellent presentation on a fascinating topic. Um, I'm sure all or most all of you know me, but I'm Brandon Rood, the Abert Family Curator of American Art at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And as you can see from my background, I've got everything set to seance lighting <laughs> of the the conversation and the uh, presentation tonight. And the um, topic of the conversation is Supernatural America, the Paranormal in American Art. And Bob Casalino is going to give us a presentation on this project, this exhibition, this catalog, followed by a discussion between the two of us and then um, some Q&A from all of you participating this evening. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Bob Casalino here to, to share his thoughts and his research on Supernatural America. Um, Robert Casalino is the pa Patrick and Amy Butler Curator of Paintings at MIA, or the Minneapolis Institute of Art where he has served since February 2016, so coming up on about five years. Um, before joining Mia, he was the senior curator and Evelyn and Will Kaplan curator of modern art at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. And before that, he held positions at the Chazen in Madison and at Princeton and at the Art Institute of Chicago where he was a researcher for and curated the works on paper and working methods section of their, their Ivan Albright retrospective in 1997. A native of Chicago, Bob has studied at the University of Illinois at Chicago before receiving his MA and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has organized, yes, <laughs> he has organized over 30 exhibitions and in many cases, smart and beautiful catalogs that accompanied them. And a small selection of which some of my favorites or relevant to tonight's topic, Art in Chicago, A History from the Fire to Now, Seeding the Ground, Chicago Encounters Surrealism, the Sorceress in the Center of Everything about Gertrude Abercrombie, Abercrombie. Uh, certainly not casting stones, Honoré Scherer's religious Im imagery in surrealism and subversion, the art of Honoré Scherer, World War I and American art for Princeton University Press that accompanied an exhibition of his, um, one of my favorite titles, Surrealism Wisconsin Style in Bats, Babes, and Broccoli, Wisconsin Magic Realists, and Peter Bloom, Nature and Metamorphosis for PAFA and the University of Pennsylvania Press. Because of his interest in and research on underrepresented artists and uncommon perspectives on well-known artists, Bob was once dubbed the curator of the dispossessed, but tonight, since he is discussing his upcoming exhibition and catalog, Supernatural America, the Paranormal in American Art, we may call him the curator of the possessed. Oh so, man. I know, sorry, I couldn't <laughs> resist. No, but you know, <laughs> it's probably going to stick. <laughs> So please give me a, uh, please give a virtual thumbs up or applause and join me in welcoming Bob Casalino. Bob, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Brandon and China and everybody helping behind the scenes. I really appreciate it. Um, and I have fond, as you know, ties to, to Wisconsin. So I wish I was actually there in person. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about an exhibition that I've been working on for several years that will open actually at the Toledo Museum of Art in June, um, travel to the Speed Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, and then close at the organizer at the Minneapolis Institute of Art in um, February of 2022. So hopefully 
we can all be there together in person uh, at that time and have a, a well-deserved party for all the things we've been going through. Um, it is an exhibition that is accompanied by a major catalog that the University of Chicago Press is uh, publishing with the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And I've served as the general editor, uh, have a couple of essays in the book, but then a whole group of different interdisciplinary authors are part of that. Some art historians and some artists like Renee Stout, John Hota Leanos, uh, Tony Osler, and others. And <clears throat> the premise of the show is that America is haunted. That haunting is personal, it's national, it's psychological, it's social. Uh, and that it comes out of lots of different kinds of experiences that happen in the body, but also have happened in the national imagination. Uh, and that ranges from spirit photographs to surrealist artists who are interested in the Gothic and automatism like Dorothea Tanning in the center there, and Alison Saar, who works as a contemporary artist with um, the idea of haints and spirits and devils and demons and how they relate to a traumatic American past. There's a lot of haunted house imagery in American scene painting that hasn't really been given a lot of attention. And uh, throughout the visual culture of the United States, uh, there's a rich literature on the supernatural, whether we're looking at John Kedor's painting of Ichabod Crane being chased by the Headless Horseman straight out of Washington Irving, um, or the immersive experience, the multi-sensory experience that goes back to the 18th and 19th century in these uh, phantasmagoria performances that happened in Philadelphia and up and down the East Coast, um, which you know takes us through the 20th century into the present day. Uh, up in the left, you see a Ouija photograph of the premiere of The Haunting, uh, which is based on Shirley Jackson's novel, The Haunting of Hill House, Poltergeist, and then, of course, Stranger Things. And, you know, I'm sure that many of you have your own favorites of podcasts that deal with the supernatural and the paranormal. It's everywhere in our culture. It permeates it. And this show looks at that, of course, but the central through line of this exhibition is taking artists seriously, who have claimed to have paranormal experiences, supernatural firsthand eyewitness um, uh, events, things they saw and felt, and then tried to translate those experiences into a visual form. Um, it looks uh, directly at the history of spiritualism, a religion that is still practiced today, and um, looks at artists who are impacted by that directly. Spiritualism is a religion that uh, has as its central tenet that the dead are not dead, they're still alive, they're in another place, but we are able to access them, talk to them, communicate with them, and they help us and intervene um, sometimes in our lives. And that there is no, um, there's really no uh, wall between the veil of the spirit and then life here on earth. And we just need to develop our individual talents in order to perceive those things. So people that might surprise you like William Sidney Mount was deeply invested in spiritualism and saw mediums and sketched them when they went on speaking tours. Harriet Hosmer was interested in spiritualism and uh, had uh, clairvoyant experiences and had prophetic dreams. James McNeil Whistler was deeply, deeply immersed in spiritualist circles in London and also in the United States. And much of his work when it was shown in the 1880s and 90s uh, was talked about by critics who were picking up on the visual cues of spiritualism, of that dark figure coming out of um, the background at a seance, things like that. So the critical language was really immersed in this too. Spiritualism was a really popular religion in the 19th century. And for many reasons, it attracted people like the suffragettes um, who were fighting for uh, women's rights as a human right, uh, social justice workers, uh, Sojourner Truth was a spiritualist when she retired in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, it was a religion that really talked about that kind of integration of humanity and the spirits that came through in seances, whether they were spirits of, Na spirits of Native Americans or others, often urged uh, this kind of uh, reform. And so it's a very interesting religion to look at from those different kinds of developments. This exhibition 
did I, as I've been organizing it, of course, I've talked to lots of colleagues, interdisciplinary um, folks in the humanities who've been working on spiritualism, which hasn't had a lot of attention in American art history at all, um, very little. Um, but I've also gone directly to living artists like Betty Saar, um, who regularly uh, work different kinds of symbols and signs of occult practice, but also of her own experience of the supernatural in her work. Um, also local artists here in Minnesota, like Choling Taha, a Cree artist who is active here, uh, who only makes these images like this one from 2017, after having a fully realized vision that is sometimes um, brought to her directly by a spirit. In this case, the spirit at the center there was somebody she actually saw and who followed her around and was teaching about healing and ecology and the world. So these are real experiences that artists have had and this exhibition takes them at their word and asks what would happen if we did that? How did that affect visual culture? How did that affect the iconography of the supernatural? What are the different visual languages of the supernatural? You know, not just those images that I showed earlier, Morris Cantor and Marvin Cohn with ghosts in haunted houses, but other kinds of things like spirit writing, which you see here on the right um, by uh, an artist named John Bunyan Murray, or the kind of imagery that Minnie Evans, uh, in a piece that's being loaned generously by the Milwaukee Art Museum, um, these are artists who had spirits guiding them, talking to them, giving them revelations, which then they made manifest to share with other people. And these artists specifically have often been uh, denigrated as outsiders or outliers um, or primitives. And this exhibition integrates them uh, through this through line with all sorts of other artists who are considered mainstream to talk about what they had in common and what kinds of experiences they wanted to make manifest through their work and really takes them again uh, through empathy uh, and the knowledge uh, systems that they were working with um, uh, very seriously. So there's a really complex deep history of visual culture in uh, this, this area. Whether we're going back to 1853, uh, and this book that's filled with fascinating illustrations um, made by uh, somebody who attended seances uh, of Jonathan Coons in uh, Ohio. Uh, and one of the things that was surprising to me about all this is that I thought I knew the spirits and the ghost aspect of this, but there's a whole component of otherworldly interplanetary and interdimensional beings that come through, not only in this kind of literature, but also in the visual culture of this material. And spiritualists often made no distinction between spirits and interplanetary visitors. So even early here, you have that angels are coming through, but they're also coming from other worlds. They're not coming from a traditional notion of a Christian heaven coming from other planets to give knowledge and wisdom to the human race. Then you also have um, image books like this, <laughs> which are done through actual channeling of spirits um, and astral projection. Uh, this is a book called Journeys to Planet Mars by a woman named Sarah Weiss, who wrote a couple of books about her experiences where she was brought to the planet Mars and shown its flora and fauna and met its inhabitants and saw its cities and heard its language, there's a glossary in the back that shows the indigenous people of Mars who call themselves Entoans, um, uh, their own language and translates what it would be in English. So it's a fascinating whole other aspect of um, how to come up with worlds. But in the case of Sarah Weiss, she really believed that that's something that she had been shown and she wanted to, to tell the world. Somebody like Ionel Toplazan, who was working in New York in the, in the 1980s and 90s, into the 2000s, um, as a boy had his first UFO experience um, and it profoundly changed the course of his life and later um, made hundreds and hundreds of drawings that look like engineering specs of UFOs where this privileged information is coming through him. And so we'll have him in the show. So why America? Why is America haunted? Um, 
I gave this a lot of thought and the image that kept coming to mind as I was organizing this exhibition was this well-known 1872 painting by the artist John Gast, which is called Mani which is called Progress. And it's basically a manifest destiny image um, that shows uh, an allegorical figure of progress who's laying the telegraph wire um, and pushing out and eradicating uh, and ultimately will want to try to destroy indigenous people and wildlife um, and in the hopes of modernizing the continent. And so when I thought about this, I thought that she has a sinister doppelganger um, that is you know, part of the true aspect of that story, uh, which is reaping souls and ghosts in its wake that remain unsettled and want to have what happened accounted for and will live with us um, and make us face these things uh, which I think um, because of all the kind of national trauma that the United States has brought upon itself, but also has experienced um, and that we're seeing um, in all the kinds of conversations around monuments and what they represent and whether they should stay and all of the things that were coming up in the culture over the last 10 months, that this has a lot to do with haunting. And as I thought about that image, somebody brought to my attention that a man named John L Hota Leanos, an artist working in California, it actually made a video that's exactly about this from an indigenous point of view. And so this time-based film, which will be in the exhibition, is sort of the framing piece. Um, and John has a beautiful essay in the exhibition that's about this exact thing. So other artists like Glenn Ligon, another contemporary artist, has also been very forthright in dealing with haunting um, from the perspective of African-American stories. Whitfield Lavelle, another artist who um, is in the exhibition, who's made a room that has a haunting in it, has also talked to me directly about these kinds of things. So it has that component as well. So my whole impetus behind this really does go back to Ivan Albright, um, an artist that some of you probably know about um, from the Chicago area. Um, and my work on him, uh, writing my dissertation on Albright, one of the things that I wanted to really question was this idea that all of his art is about death and decay. And his formative experience is really being taught by his father, who was a professional artist from Monroe, Wisconsin, and had studied with Thomas Aikens. But the real training happened in the First World War when he and his brother enlisted. And Ivan Albright, these are his own photographs that he took uh, in, in France during World War I, was based at a hospital uh, near the front and uh, was given the assignment of drawing surgical and medical procedures of the wounded coming right from the front with catastrophic wounds. All people his age from his generation um, who he had the experience of talking to, listening to, and then drawing their wounds. And that's what they look like um, in these notebooks that Albright filled. And many people have um, written about the fact that, well, this must be why Albright seemed to focus on the macabre or decay, that the body was vulnerable and he was showing that. But one of the things that you see in these and the key to Albright's vision and how it connects to the supernatural is that Albright actually traced the healing process from catastrophic wounds. And that's something that really fascinated him. And so, um, one of the things he really recounted in notebooks is this search for an internal life force that's intangible and mysterious and animates us and connects us. And lots of soldiers coming from the trenches talked about having these experiences of seeing angels intervening in battle, um, strange experiences that they could not account for, hearing voices. The paranormal and the supernatural were rife on the World War I battlefield which resulted in a resurgence of spiritualism in the 1920s. So Albright's paintings of bodies, when we go back to them, um, really come out of that idea of a search for meaning of life and being unsatisfied with the materiality of flesh and knowing there's something else there and trying to depict that in visual form. So in a late painting like the Vermonter, which will be in the exhibition, looking at these color halos that are all over the body and coming out of sleeves um, makes you see that there's this whole language of high 
a highly realist degree of representation that contrasts with the way that American art history has talked about the spiritual as a language and art that is usually through abstraction. But looking at Albright's work um, and foregrounded really in this exhibition is how realist experience can be used to depict what is the supernatural and the intangible. Of course, this idea of loss and wanting to make contact with the dead and your loved ones also had a profound impact on the sort of mourning process after the Civil War. This is an Emanuel Leutze painting called Angel on the Battlefield. And um, that idea of making contact is um, something that is a through line throughout the exhibition. From the earliest piece in the exhibition, this tiny miniature from the uh, 1780s, showing a woman at the grave of her daughter and the spirit of the daughter coming out and making contact with her, to spirit photographs. Um, rather than looking at spirit photographs as a kind of technical gimmickry, what the, they are, the way that they're contextualized in this exhibition um, is in the idea of how they were socially used, what the need they, what they had, they, what, what need they filled, which was in the mourning process and the grieving process. So this album that Tony Osler uh, owns um, will be in it with all these spirit photographs tipped into it. The visual culture and the material culture of the, the supernatural in spiritualism, like these Ouija boards will be in the exhibition, other kinds of talking boards and devices for contacting the dead and listening to their messages will also be in, whether it's Robert Hare's spiritograph on the bottom um, or these other kinds of devices that can be used by ordinary people and mediums, all loaned generously by a collector named Brandon Hodge in Austin, Texas, who's a, a connoisseur of this material. And, you know, there's some sensational moments uh, in the history of spiritualism. We're looking at famous mediums, but I did field work at two uh, spiritualist camps in Camp Chesterfield, Indiana and Lilydale, New York, where I met mediums like Susan Barnes there in the center um, and talked to them about what spiritualism meant for them and what the experience of being a medium was like now. Um, and so their input really affects how the show is framed. I did actually go get a reading and Brandon, we could talk about this afterwards, um, in Lilydale with a fifth generation spiritualist named um, uh, Gretchen Clark and had some profoundly unusual experiences that way. So the last part of this talk, I wanna introduce a whole bunch of new artists that probably you've not seen before who are going to be central to this exhibition in addition to the well-known ones you've already looked at. Um, and that's spirit artists. Um, and what I mean by that is not just the kind of way that uh, gift drawings in Shakerism, like these two examples here, um, were communicated and made, which was that um, there was a revelation from a spiritual being and then the artist made an image of what that revelation was. Spirit artists, um, and a lot of them have been getting attention in Europe, um, who worked in the late 19th century and 20th century, like Helma af Klimt on the left, Georgiana Houghton on the right, or Emma Kuntz, uh, all European practitioners of spirit art were mediums who had spirits inhabit their bodies. And then the spirits, they said, made the art, not the artist. All these spirit artists I'm about to show you were insistent that they were not responsible for the art. The spirit inhabited their body and made the work in trance states. And so the earliest of these that are in the show are paint drawings from 1860s, like this piece by Pet and Wella Anderson, who are a couple a married couple, um, Pet was the instrument who channeled spirits and made drawings of these ancient people who came through. There was a third medium who um, was kind of like a historian who was able to tell the stories and biographies of who these people were. And they were all exhibited in San Francisco uh, in the 1870s. And there's a book that you can access online that talks about all of them. Um, there was a number of artists who are completely new and would have, would, are almost unknown and forgotten, except at these spiritual camps, um, like this artist named Lizzie Connor, who um, was not trained as an artist at all, but one day in a trance state started to hold a pencil and make images that came through and eventually started making portraits that were of uh, deceased family members of the founders of Camp Chesterfield, like this um, daughter who was named uh, Ida Bronnenberg. 
uh, Mary or May and Lizzie Bangs were sisters who did an unusual um, form of art, which is precipitated spirit painting. And what that means is that these are images that are made without the intervention of a human hand. There's lots of testimonials in newspapers about this um, where witnesses would see a blank canvas uh, put in a cabinet and uh, the cabinet closed up. And during the course of a seance, the image of the deceased, the person in spirit, would precipitate almost like rain, um, like an environmental situation blooming up on the canvas um, without any kind of art materials nearby uh, to form the image of the deceased who'd come through and given a message. This one is a tour de force being lent by Camp Chesterfield that shows a man, uh, a Dr. Doherty, who came to sit for the Bang sisters and then asked for his dead wife to be there too. And she came and after she came, he said, why can't the twins come? Because apparently his daughters were dead too. And they appeared before his eyes on the canvas. So you have many counts of this happening um, uh, at seances, but only two sets of people we, have, we know of, the Campbell brothers and the Bang sisters were these practitioners. Um, you have groups of mediums that are getting together, including in Wisconsin, and having these um, pedagogical circles where spirits are imparting knowledge um, through a medium who's writing things down. And some of these folks would actually make automatic drawings. So Helen Butler Wells led a group called the Janssen Group in New York uh, and made these extraordinary ectoplasmic organic uh, drawings while she was also getting messages uh, of pedagogy from um, very famous student uh, uh, spirits from the past. Um, other people in that circle are Emily Talmadge on the left and also uh, Norma Oliver, who worked um, again in trance states, channeling the personalities of earlier folks. Um, another artist that was completely new to me is Marion uh, uh, Spore Bush, who was one of the first women to graduate from the University of Michigan's dentistry program in the beginning of the 20th century, and then had her own practice before a profound personal loss led her to travel for a while and then end up in New York, contact her dead mother through a medium, and then discover that spirits were telling her to start making art. And so she did make art uh, with their collaboration. Um, this is the painting that was on that easel called Aquabird, um, and um, when she started making these paintings in the 1920s and 30s, the spirits were all, almost all of their messages were apocalyptic messages about a coming war that were published um, in the 1920s and 30s in different newspapers um, because she became a socialite and was in the news a lot, but she was making these spirit paintings under the um, influence of a whole chorus of spirits she always called they. She never said who they actually were. Um, and all of the paintings have this warlike uh, tenor because the messages, which were very specific uh, that the spirits were giving her, were all about a big global war that would involve the Pacific. <laughs> and during World War II, she showed these. Um, and it really did seem like she had been getting a prophetic series of messages from the spirit world to try to urge for peace. Another artist, this is somebody who was um, active at Lilydale, uh, but based in uh, Michigan initially, um, received messages from a dead physician who wanted to uh, demystify the, the experience of being a medium, what happens in mediumship. And so, uh, is a complicated story and I can elaborate on later, but the basically uh, Clara Barnett, who is this, this medium, uh, produced a whole series of watercolors based on this dead physician's teaching to her that show what happens in different mediumship trance states. So this is trance, this is um, a physical medium in a cabinet uh, channeling the spirit of a ghost who's gonna come into their body. This is automatic writing this is transfiguration, where the spirit is inhabiting the body of a medium, and you can see that kind of blur simultaneously. 
Um, and the, the whole point of this was to try to show what was happening behind the scenes in mediumship. And so they look like instructional uh, illustrations. They're very peculiar in that way. And these are all at Lilydale's um, museum. Uh, two more artists to tell you about. One is Francis Haynes McVeigh, who was trained at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, but became a medium working at uh, Camp Chesterfield in Indiana. That's a self-portrait on the left. And started producing work like this um, with uh, the collaboration primarily of two spirits, the spirit of Edward Manet and the spirit of William Blake most often William Blake. So if you wanted to know what William Blake did in his retirement in the afterworld, he was inhabiting Francis McVeigh's body and helping her make images like this um, and this automatic trance states uh, producing these drawings and paintings. And a whole suite of drawings she called soul travel drawings, uh, which have automatic writing at the bottom, but also one continuous line that uh, if you read the writing, purports to show the path that a soul takes after it leaves the body and moves around and then enters its destination. So that's what all of these drawings purport from the 1950s to show. And William Blake seems to be the collaborator with all of these. Finally, Agatha Wojciechowski was probably the best known in the art world because she was shown um, at Cordier and Ekstrom in the 1960s, discovered by Richard Linder, um, and also uh, at David Zwerner's gallery um, in, uh, well, Rudolf Zwerner in, in Europe. She was a medium and um, a spiritualist reverend who traveled around and did healing um, and didn't really think of herself as an artist. She was urged to make drawings by spirits and didn't know what the heck they were doing, or why they were trying to get her to do this because she wasn't trained, but she had a gift for it. And they used her body sometimes to do tracings of hands and feet um, of people that would come to sit for her. And they're filled in with all of the spirits um, of this person's past lives um, and also guardian spirits and ancestor spirits. So that's what you see there. But most often she did things like this, which are extraordinarily colorful watercolors, always done from the bottom left in a, in a band um, upward that have the revelation gradually of spirits in these magical landscapes. Um, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these. If you go to the American Folk Art Museum in New York's website, you can see a short film that one of her students did on her and you can see her actually working, which is where the still in the upper left comes from. So that's an introduction to the exhibition and some of the things that will be in it, some of the themes that are in it. And I'm happy to take questions now um, if Brandon, uh, you, you have any. Oh, I have a lot, Bob. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> that was that was fantastic. Thank you so much. That was um, as incredible as I was expecting it to be. And of course, I had, um, as mentioned, a few questions. I'm starting out based on the limited amount yeah. I knew of the uh, project, the exhibition. But of course, I feel like I would um, uh, be remiss if I did not start by asking you about the profoundly unusual experience you had. <laughs> and I don't know if you meant that was just meant to be between the two of us, or if you would be willing to share uh, some of that experience. Mm -hmm. And maybe also, did it give you greater faith in, in the art and the practice or um, skepticism? So, so I was born on Halloween, Brandon. So ah. all of this is a foregone conclusion that I would have to do this eventually. Um, so I have had lots of strange experiences personally all throughout my life. Um, and, uh, you know, they've ranged from when I was living in Chicago um, in the 90s. Uh, living in a house where one of my housemates' mothers was a Santeria priestess, and she would come over and do do readings with divining stones, but she also um, would hear stories that were about, she interpreted as spirits getting in the way of some of our friends' personal lives in different ways, and that resulted in some rituals and some cleansings happening in our house. Um, and after each one of those experiences, 
all of those things went away. So, you know, I'm all in. <laughs> I'm, I've seen uh, plenty of stuff that has made me think there's something else that's out there. You know, I'm totally like Agent, Agent Mulder. Um, uh, I want to believe, I don't know about UFOs, but I've heard a lot of people talk about those things. Um, when I sat for Gretchen uh, uh, Clark in Lilydale, uh, she, you know, the way that the, at least this particular medium talked about it, and a lot of mediums talk about it, is it almost though they're not always on and available, but when they sit for mediumship, it's like they're tuning in a channel on a radio station, and then the sort of things come in, messages come in, and the spirits will start to tell them things or show them things. And for me, there were a number of ancestral spirits with enough extraordinarily specific information about what was associated with their lives and what kinds of things they would have said that it was totally, there was, it was baffling as to how else it could have been conveyed because they're only stories that my family knows. So it was, yeah, man, it was something. Excellent. That will um, then lead to one of the questions I had formulated in advance, and it was really about your um, personal experience, but leading into your professional experience working in Chicago, working in Wisconsin. And I know that we had talked about the project um, at various points, and there seemed to be some really interesting I thought, Wisconsin connections. Um, you showed the mini Evans from the mm -hmm. Mill museum um you've also talked about in the past the morris pratt institute in milwaukee mm -hmm. the yeah. for spirituality i know at one point in time there were the seance robes from the wisconsin historical society yeah that were being considered for the exhibition i was also then thinking about somebody like the um charles von shakes um, photographs of Black River Falls mm -hmm. that were um, kind of turned into the the cult classic 70s book Wisconsin Death Trip. Yeah, and those photographs also involved in in many cases the deceased and even some witches. And mm -hmm. so, there's something particular to Wisconsin. Is there something particular to the Midwest or a region, or really does it kind of cross these divides and boundaries and what has been your experience with that? So uh, it does cross these divides and boundaries. It's all over the place. You, know, you think of New Orleans, um, which has its own extraordinarily rich and complex history in relation to the subject matter. Um, and California and the West, um, if you think about John McCracken, you know, and how <laughs> in the last week there was those John McCrackens that were showing up in Utah and uh, was it Romania? I can't remember where else. Um, uh, you know, John McCracken, who's a minimalist sculptor, uh, always talked about how he had a, a belief that there was interplanetary visitors, they were among us, and he was trying to make the kind of sculpture that um, looked like it could have been placed down here by a UFO. He was forthright about that. He had so many other kinds of things to say about that. And you know, it's an inconvenient, embarrassing thing for a lot of scholars when an artist says that kind of thing. But I've always run to that. <laughs> and maybe it is that Midwestern context and knowing people like John Wildey, um, Walter Hamity, Sylvia Fine, people like that in, the, in from Wisconsin or, or in Chicago, um, you know, being a high school student and seeing the Harry Who's work uh, and the Chicago Images work and just thinking nothing of it uh, as unusual, but thinking it's part of this just backyard in my neighborhood, you know, in a way. Um, so I've always been drawn to this stuff. And I think that in the Midwest, um, you know, as you, you're right to point out, the Morris Pratt Institute, uh, which is just outside of Milwaukee, it's in um, Wauwatosa, I think technically, um, is America's first spiritualist college and it still trains people and has an amazing library and archive of material. Um, and then the Wanawak spiritualist camp is still active. Um, and in this Wisconsin State Historical Society, there's a robe that a, a medium wore 
when she was channeling that will be in the exhibition. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of, there's still so much visual and material culture um, of spiritualism that just hasn't been contended with and dealt with in American art history, partly because you, know, you have to go to those camps and you have to get to know folks and understand um, on their terms what all this stuff is about and get their trust in order to then have access to look at these things. Um, you know, one of the things that I really felt uh, right away in Lilydale and Camp Chesterfield and looking at Morris Pratt is that, you know, there really needs to be a national preservation plan for spiritualist material culture. There isn't one right now. And these small institutions, these tiny museums that are doing their best to hold stuff really uh, could, could benefit from that. So I'm talking to some of the folks who run them about helping with grants because there's so many underknown and unknown um, figures in this in this area that um, could benefit from some action, some real research. So, um, but you know, there's in Wis I've always wondered uh, about Wisconsin because you know I've been to Fred Smith's Concrete Park and to Prairie Moon and to Grandview um, just outside of Madison and all of those places where somebody who had no who never was trained as an artist suddenly started making stuff and made profoundly amazing things that have a presence that's beyond just the physical, but also are extraordinary objects from a technical point of view. So um, that is clearly a show for the Kohler Art Foundation to do though, but they've probably already done it three times. Um, thank you very much. That is kind of a nice segue into the next question I had, and I'm really glad that you talked about it and brought it up. And that was the role of um, outsider artists or artists of color. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, um, of course, uh, uh, Minnie Evans, going back to that, or um, and then somebody not necessarily we would classify as an outsider, Betty Saar. Um, using this, at least in the early days, as a ref part of a reform movement or social justice. And oftentimes with outsider artists and uh, Black artists in particular, um, as you know, they're endowed with a kind of a um, uh, extra sensory, um, kind of a, a spirituality, something of uh, a comfort to uh, white people in moments of distress. Um, mm -hmm. For research or um, writing or looking into this project, um, bear out something a little bit different, that it was maybe more about the art as a pathway to advancement or a pathway to these reform movements and social justice and spirituality was just the mechanism of, of this pathway. So. Um, yeah, all of the artists who are in this exhibition, um, either uh, we have in the archival record that they had these experiences themselves, or they knew somebody that did and they wanted to translate that experience. Um, it affected them. You know, I don't know that Dorothea Tanning saw ghosts, um, but she sure talked about them constantly. Um, and so with all the living artists, to me, it was only, I would only ever do an exhibition where I'm actually able to talk to all of those folks and ask them, is this an appropriate show for you to be in? Do you feel that this is subject matter that moves you? And I had some gut sort of feelings about some people like Whitville Lavelle, for instance, whose work I've admired for a great, a long time. And finally, it just was nagging at me that he, he had a place in the exhibition and I reached out to him directly. Um, so I know that, you know, for a lot of folks, we don't have that kind of oral history. They weren't in the art world. Nobody was, very few people were paying attention to them. Their work was only valued later and it was caught up in, you know, market packaging of self-taught artists or something like that. But where possible, what I've really wanted to make sure is that all of those artists' voices are front and center and they're the ones that are telling the stories. And none of them thought of themselves, um, as far as I can tell, as an outsider relative to the art world. They just thought, these are the things I'm making. I'm making them because they mean something in my life or in my community. And rather than label them, 
I'm bringing them together through uh, the thematic, the, the thematic sort of unifying theme of seeing seeing spirits or having spirits enter them or talk to them or having this ability um, that is valued in their community to be a healer and have the art absolutely hand in hand with that. Um, so, you know, I've chafed against labels most of my career um, and tried not to use them because most often they're, they're invented by some authority or critic or, or something rather than the artists themselves. And so in this exhibition, I'm not making distinctions between people who are insiders in the art world or professionally trained artists and others. I'm really looking at what can we, what, if we get rid of those binaries, what, what um, kind of productive way of seeing art differently can we come to by just taking the artists at, on their terms and putting these things in juxtaposition with one another. I mean, having Whistler in an exhibition with Minnie Evans is probably the only kind of thing that I would do, um, but they're currently planned to be in the same room together. And it's partly because, you know, uh, that shared experience of really believing that there's the spirit that's talking or bringing messages forth. And those Whistler paintings, that particular one it was talked about so many times from different critics in London as looking like an apparition at a spirit, at, at a seance. And so, you know, that's in part one of the things that Minnie Evans is showing, um, but you have other, other folks too um, who, you know, there's, a, there's some artists who didn't want to be part of the show and I respected that, um, uh, who had UFO experiences, who had visited, been visited by aliens, they, they really felt, um, and translated those experiences. And a lot of these experiences are, they're traumatic and they're personal and they're intimate and they're not necessarily things that they wanted to, everybody to, to share, but they had to get them out, um, get them on paper. So those folks who really did want to share them with the community or for whom there was a value in doing that, they're the ones who are included in this exhibition. And, you know, I've really striven by working with a wide range of different kinds of community advisors to do it in an empathetic and sensitive way. That's great. Thank you very much. No, that, that's um, um, absolutely fantastic. And I was curious then kind of looking back historically at some of the more historical art from the early 19th century. I'm a particular fan of John Kedor. Um, I love the uh, Washington Irving um, series of paintings that he did. The, the Headless Hor Horseman is a particular favorite. Um, knowing that someone like John Kedor uh, painted a lot of Irving stories um, is there a suggestion that he himself was also attracted to the spiritual? Or in that sense, is it more a, a painterly manifestation of this phenomena, of these stories, of the American psyche at that particular moment versus mm -hmm. um, seeing spirits or channeling spirits, yeah. um, the, the more contemporary later works you talked about? Well, <clears throat> Um, with Kedor, it does seem like there's something in him that's drawn to it over and over again. There could have been a market, there could have been patrons who were interested in having these supernatural tales trans translated by him. Um, in the case of somebody like his contemporary William Sidney Mount, we know that Mount um, and his whole family uh, had this feeling that the paranormal was normal. Uh, they all had different kinds of experiences that are well documented. And Mount went to mediums and participated in seance circles. And, um, you know, at one point made a spirit drawing of Rembrandt because Rembrandt was the spirit who often came through and talked to Mount and, you know, flattered Mount about his abilities as an artist. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing that that makes me sort of wonder is if that is a central interest to Mount and he isn't just sort of reading about it, he's actually a participant. Um, how does that then make us look at those other later genre paintings um, and interpret what's going on in them? Um, at PAFA, where I used to be a curator, one of the most famous paintings in the collection is the, um, the Painter's Triumph um, that Mount did. And 
lately I've been thinking about what does that have to do with mediumship and spiritualism? And, and I think, you know, hopefully in a show like this, that, you know, you do all this work, you put out a catalog, you have lots of different people write new perspectives on things, but a lot of the, the real conclusions and implications aren't really evident until after that's done. And so I'm hoping that people are going to come to this and, you know, other another generation of scholars and, and artists are going to look at this material and maybe see themselves in it or be excited or say, hey, wait a minute, there's this other painting that isn't in the show that is seems to really, really be about this and that'll generate new scholarship on that. Because I think I'm already kind of thinking about that. You know, what is the lens that you put on when you know that about somebody's background now? And how does it change the way you see that work and interpret it? It's not gonna take the other meanings away. It's gonna just add and make it deeper. No, I think that's a great attitude. Oftentimes we think of the catalog as the definitive, the be all end all, it's the end of the story. And really once it comes off the press, it's obsolete and it's really the beginning of a whole new story. Mm -hmm. So I think that's fantastic. We have about 10 minutes left and as you know, the um, program tonight is being sponsored by the American Arts Society, the support group for the American Art Department. And mm -hmm. we're being joined by some dedicated docents who also have a few questions. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to um, go ahead and provide those now. So Mary Beth Mahoney asks, um, she is curious to know if Forrest Bess from Texas is part of the exhibition, or if he has any insights into his work, meaning you, Bob. Um, not sure if his work was inspired by spirits or merely by dreams, but his work is very otherworldly. Yeah, so he, Forrest Best is, uh, Forrest Best is an artist who um, had been on the checklist early on. Um, I had this hunch that he, absolutely belonged in the exhibition. Um, and so I had a few small scale paintings, um, you know, like eight by 10 inch paintings on the checklist. But as I continued to read about him, you know, I'd seen many of them in person. Um, I just couldn't find any link directly between him. And I thought it was going to be about, um, you know, UFOs, alien contact, something having to do with the cosmos and inter interplanetary beings, um, interdimensional beings um, in the post-war period. Um, but I couldn't really find any links. And um, in terms of ghosts or spirits, again, you know, he definitely was somebody who um, was living life on his own terms and uh, did all sorts of things that would probably be considered you know, at the time, counterculture and radical, um, and was a seeker, but I didn't see a direct link between this subject matter and him. I wanted to, and I really dug, but I, I couldn't come up with anything, sadly, because I would, I love his work, and I would love it to be in there, but I couldn't in good faith include it, because I couldn't find the connection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ruthie Dibble, who is a member of our American Art Society board, asks, how did you distinguish between religion and the supernatural as you selected works and themes for the show? Um, as an example, she says the Immaculate Conception seems pretty supernatural. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, the exhibition uh, really is focusing on... Uh, people having direct experiences. And so having been eyewitnesses or having, um, you know, somebody close to them uh, have a profound experience of the paranormal or the supernatural, and then looking at how do they translate that into a visual form. And so um, when we, you know, I, I really felt like there was going to have to be a clear demarcation between um, traditional religious iconography uh, that has been dealt with in so many, you know, deep and complex ways and, and lots of other shows. Um, even though American art history, uh, American art historians have really come to the study of religion and art very, very late. Um, 
<laughs> it's really only been the last 15 years where you've seen a lot of interest in dealing with Jewish artists and what that has to do with their work and how it informs it. Um, you know, and there, there's been shows on Andy Warhol on being a Catholic, stuff like that. For a long time, people just avoided that stuff um, for whatever reason. There's lots of reasons, but, um, you know, I have done a great deal of work on looking at how the artists that I'm most involved in, you know, mid-century magic realists like George Tooker and Honoré Cher and um, people like that translated the art of the past and were attracted to religious iconography and they, they used it to comment on contemporary themes that were relevant to their lives, but they're not people who are having paranormal experiences. And the only one that comes close is that there's, an, there's a Henry Asawa Tanner ex painting in the exhibition. Um, and the reason why I included it is because Tanner, it's really clear, was um, showing with and running in circles in France that uh, overlapped with the symbolist group. And the way that he makes his uh, religious paintings around 1900 and a little afterward uh, completely breaks with the traditional way of showing the iconography. And it looks at how one can translate that in a way that doesn't show, for instance, the angel Gabriel floating in as a human being with wings. Um, you know, the famous painting in Philadelphia, he shows that as a shaft of light, as this otherworldly, mysterious, incomprehensible experience. And so I felt like Tanner was doing something that was completely different than say, um, I don't know, Al, Al, uh, Thayer or somebody else who's showing Madonnas. Um, it had to have that other kind of way of trying to completely get away from known iconography and invent something new that tried to get at this experience that was happening through the body or that was completely um, inexpressible otherwise. So there's been so many shows that are about that other thing and I wanted to try to find what are other ways that artists are trying to show this experience. That's great. And then the final question though qualified with um, a follow-up that said, oh, she was an American. But I thought it would be interesting to pose it to you as the final question because it was uh, such a sensation at the Guggenheim. And that is about Hilma Alf Cliff yeah. and if she would fit into this group. Well, she would because, you know, she said that um, what she was doing is making art uh, with spirits. Um, the spirits were guiding her hand. And so, you know, she's absolutely the kind of the kind of artist who would be in this exhibition. Um, but because I'm focusing on, you know, what American artists had to do with this for the first time, uh, you know, she's not in it. And, you know, it is interesting because there have been a lot of shows in the last few years that are looking at those artists, but all of them, as far as I can tell, um, you know, they're all European artists. The ones that I mentioned, Georgiana Houghton is an amazing um, artist who was active in the mid 19th century to the, the last decade of the, the 19th century. She was a medium um, and she was involved in spiritualist and parapsychology circles. Um, but she was also channeling and that's what she was doing when she was making those drawings. So I wanted to find out, is there an American equivalent? Um, what does that look like? And so that's what's being presented in this exhibition. And is there a single American equivalent or, or no? You would be like asking who your favorite child was. Um, yeah, uh, I would say Francis Haynes McVeigh comes close. There's, there's dozens and dozens of artwork, uh, artworks, paintings and drawings at Camp Chesterfield that she did. Um, you know, they're not, they're not the equivalent of Hilna of Klimt's scale uh, okay. or anything like that. But for somebody who's really deeply invested in this and, in, in, you know, um, you know, working as a medium, uh, not just an artist, but working as a medium, but trained initially as an artist. She's one of the few of those folks who was formally trained. Like I said, she went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, probably in the, the teens or 20s, probably in the 20s. Um, so, you know, somebody who already knew how to move paint around and, and think about composition, but then when she makes these trance drawings, 
uh, all of that seems to go by the wayside and they are completely articulated in a different manner, like another voice is speaking. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, I can't thank you enough for this absolutely amazing and fantastic presentation. I cannot wait to see the exhibition when it opens in Toledo in June. And then of course, to um, uh, uh, visit uh, Minneapolis in, in person mm -hmm. uh, to, to see it as well. Um, it would be great to catch up more and uh, see it all through your eyes. So I want to extend my most heartfelt thanks to you to the American Arts Society for their um, sponsorship and for attending tonight. And of course, for all our wonderful um, dedicated docents who have also been attending and um, a few comments from people um, saying, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Well, so thank you all yeah. for coming. <laughs> Everybody thank me uh, virtually and uh, um, uh, join me in, in, in virtually thanking Bob um, for his excellent presentation and time and uh, it's been wonderful. Well, thank you, Brandon. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Yeah.